fortunately, your folders are done. Right? That doesn't mean everything else is done. Huh? That doesn't mean everything else is done. I know. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that uh, at least part of your load is accounted for. Okay. okay, so we have. Uh, have had a couple things come up on Facebook. It looks like people are getting involved with some of those. Um, we have speakers, we have two different speakers today in back to back sections. And so um, you guys will hear Ben McCready today, and then the other section will listen to Dr. Gonna Overway. Uh, and then we'll play a uh, video next week of each of them. You'll we'll see Dr. Gonna Overway, and the other class will see Ben McCready. Um, so Ben uh, and I have known each other for about three years now um, through a mutual friend, and it just turned out Ben is also an athletic trainer, so we had that in common. It turned out that we knew some of the same people from a ways back in different points in our life. Um, and so we got to talking, and I, I found out that he is a firefighter, has been for some time now, professional firefighter down in the Waynesboro Fishersville area, uh, and uh, is an EMT. And, you know, over the years, uh, well, this past summer, I think, he told me about his latest project, which is he was kind of recruited to work for Vesta Healthcare um, to do some uh, uh, worksite screenings and making sure that people are safe in the worksite and looking into ways to prevent uh, corporate loss by making sure that nobody became injured on the job. And so this is kind of a new, newer field. Uh, it's becoming more and more uh, common because of the amount of money that is sunk into corporate law. So you even see companies that are very proud of the fact that they've gone X amount of hours without a company injury, right? And so there's a lot of money sunk into non-productive time. Okay? Yeah, if you've taken my exercise prescription class, you've seen that I talk about direct and indirect costs to some of the conditions and special populations. And those indirect costs are basically us having to care for people from worksite injuries and not making a profit off of their skills. Okay? And so Ben's going to talk a little bit about how he's gotten into that uh, and uh, uh, kind of a little bit about the newest, newest trends in that and also in emergency medicine a little bit too. Uh, I've, I've actually used him in classes, but I may not have said them. Said them. Um, he's got great stories about being an EMT, and I don't remember what class it was, but most of those stories start with, so this 400 pound guy, okay? So, anyhow, I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you. Uh, it's one o'clock on a Friday. I'm sure you guys would probably rather be outside. That's nice. But, uh, so thanks for listening. So I went to West Virginia University. I got my bachelor's in athletic training. National Certified Athletic Trainer. I went to JMU, got my master's in athletic administration. I uh, was a graduate assistant there. I uh, did that for two years, graduated with my master's. I went back to my hometown in West Virginia and I was an athletic trainer for Health South and I worked as an outreach to the high school. And Health South, right at that time, was they're famous for like the Enron of the health field. They uh, got caught in like a big Medicare fraud scam and I got laid off along with seven other athletic trainers. And so I took the job at Mary Baldwin College as the, an athletic trainer there. And I was a volunteer firefighter and the chief uh, of Augusta County said, hey, why don't you come work for us? And I started looking at the hours and the money. And it was a lot better than it was uh, in the kind of column that I had. So I got into firefighting, but I still kept up my athletic training stuff. And I was doing uh, you know, some little bit of consulting and stuff for different fire departments on stuff they could do. And uh, I talked to uh, Scott Crabtree at Augusta Health. He's the Director of Physical Therapy said, Hey, we're starting this program. It's called Industrial Therapy. Why don't you come down and check it out? We think it'd be great to, to work with it. So, over the last just a little over a year, I've been doing uh, all my days off from the Langford Fire Department. I've been doing industrial therapy. And I'll show you exactly what that is and what we do and how we go. So, we're going to go over injury statistics with workers. We'll look at the cost of an injury out in the field. We're going to talk about ergonomics. What is ergonomics? Uh, what is industrial therapy that we do? We'll look at how to prevent injuries in the workplace. Um, I have a functional job description, which is what we go in and write up. It's a big word for pretty much their job description. And we're going to look at the workers' comp cycle and the cycle of the people who get into when they're injured. Uh, it's a, a pretty vicious cycle. The worst thing you see is someone's injured on the job, they get on pain pills, they get addicted to pain pills, they get divorced from their wife, they lose their family. It can really be debilitating for them to just have that one injury back injury. 
And then I'm going to go over a few of the things in EMS, draw back some folks with the EMS stuff. And uh, so I'm going to go over what's new, what we're doing with the EMS. So, in 2013, there were 3 million workplace injuries and illnesses. Half of those resulted in people having to take time off work. Um, of those, 95% were actually injuries versus illnesses. And that's because everyone's getting better about people wearing respirators, looking at the lead paint and stuff. Um, that when there is asbestos, they set up the fields so that people aren't going through asbestos. So you're seeing less, in, less illnesses, but we're still seeing a lot of injuries. And the majority of those were in a private industrial setting. So there are more than 2.9 million injuries, and half of those were musculoskeletal. So that's where physical therapists, athletic trainers come in. Who's best to work with musculoskeletal injuries? Physical therapists, athletic trainers. We have some physicians out there, workers' comp physicians, who couldn't tell you what a Lockman's test was for the ACL. They don't know anything about it, or what a slap lesion is in the shoulder. Here we, we, get, we can see that and identify that. Um, on those, the most expensive is back injuries. Back injuries are very, very expensive. So medical costs have skyrocketed here recently. Um, and it's been going up for quite some time. So you're looking now for a knee or a shoulder surgery, probably around 50000 probably just going to be ballpark what that's going to cost. Uh, about 30000 for the carpal tunnel surgeries. Um, back surgeries, um, one of the guys that I work with, his wife just had a uh, um, partial mastectomy in her back, it was $225,000. So you can see one of those injuries on the job that you're paying for, you can see that we can prevent that injury, how much money we can actually save. So the surgery is really only about half of the cost because now the company has to find someone to come in and work for that person. We got to either hire a temp or pay people over time, which is expensive. We have a product you're making. If you're making air conditioners, that line is going to slow down because you're having to train someone who's new that's in there to make up for it. So the company's losing money on that. If it's something bad, there's going to be no shows going to come in and they're going to do an investigation. They're there, especially with the death and dismemberment and stuff. And there's probably going to be an internal investigation. Someone has to keep track of that person, making sure that they're going to physical therapy, following up with the doctor, what is going on with them. All of that is money. All of it is going right out the window uh, just to pay for an injury. Versus if you have money that you're investing, say if you can buy a new piece of machinery, it's probably going to increase productivity. This money is not going to increase productivity. This is just money that you're spending on an injury. Um, <coughs> So it's really just the tip of the iceberg, just the surgery part or the injury part of going to the hospital. Uh, litigation, that's, that's quite common with workplace injuries. In fact, if you go home and, and you watch television during the day, you'll see, are you injured on the job? Call this workplace lawyer, we can get you this much. So then they're into a lawyer that's also going to have to you know, represent the company. There are the, the, the workers looking at a lawyer, and now we have all the court expenses to go along with it. So it can get quite costly. So the benefits of injury prevention, they far outweigh the cost. Um, an exercise program, you know, flexibility program for, for a company to do that, doesn't cost a whole lot. Um, Walker Caterpillar, they started doing some of this stuff. They started paying for, for their employees to go to gyms, the gym memberships. And every dollar they spent, they actually got back $7 in savings by having less people injured and on sick leave. So the healthier workforce, obviously, is more productive. So, uh, you have the healthy guys that are out there working, they're just going to be more productive than someone who's always coming in and saving and calling off sick. So OSHA, OSHA is a state and government agency. Um, they've really come a long way. Their whole goal is to try to prevent injuries and illnesses. Um, and since they came about in the 70s, they've really decreased workplace deaths by about 40%. OSHA has a huge book of all types of different regulations that they have, anything from wearing a vest and safety glasses, to scaffolding and the type of equipment that you need for the scaffolding so that people don't fall off. Um, usually, an OSHA standard has come about so that, um, usually because someone got injured or was killed in the workplace, it's really got an OSHA standard that's come out. So OSHA can come on site, they can make it, they can do an investigation, they can find people, uh, find businesses, if they find someone that's dangerous and they haven't corrected it. Workers can call OSHA and say, hey, I need you to come down and check this out, the scaffolding doesn't look right. And OSHA can do that. The company cannot have any type of litigation towards the worker for doing that. That is uh, the worker's right to do that. OSHA uh, has also come up with the right to know stuff, the chemicals, the MSDS sheets. On so OSHA has brought about all that. It used to be back in the 70s, you went to work, it was really dangerous. You 
a lot of factories. There were a lot of injuries and, and a lot of deaths, and it was just written off as much as part of the job. If you're a welder, you're probably going to get burned at some point. It was just written off as part of the job. Uh, but now when I started to realize, hey, you know, we need to really look at the safety. Uh, we want the people to be able to retire. Um, so they can do on-site investigations. Um, if there's a serious injury, death, or dismemberment, those two will probably be on-site with investigation. The only thing is, there's not a whole lot of OSHA people to be doing all the investigations versus all the companies that are out there. It's just not enough. Um, so OSHA might make it to some businesses once every five years, once every ten years, um, to try to get out there. So companies, and they don't want fined by OSHA, they will call people in and they will contract them out to do stuff to see if they can try to prevent injuries for them. Not just because they don't want to be fined by OSHA, but because they're going to save money. So, real good ergonomics, how to prevent workplace injuries. Um, just, I'll just give one story out. We went to a company in Verona, and they make very large air conditioners. And we were walking in, and there's a huge hole in their pavement, in, in the asphalt. And we went in and said, hey, you got a huge hole out there, so we can trip and fall and get hurt. They said, that's going to be 20000 for us to resurface the laptop. We don't have the money. It was two weeks later, a young lady came into the clinic. And she had fallen in that hole, she broke her shoulder, and they paid that right out $30,000 for the surgery. So right there, the company already spent $30,000, and they still don't have a new laptop. So then they had to go buy, uh, put a new laptop in, so they're looking at $50,000 right there, where if they had just invested, and you could look at it as an investment, if they had just put the new laptop in, they could have prevented everything all together. And it wasn't fun for the woman. She had a quite serious break, and had pins and rods, and, and it's a lot of physical therapy for her back in the So. All right, ergonomics, what is ergonomics? It's the practice of designing products and systems to take proper account of the interaction between them and the people who use them. So really it's pretty much the worker and how the worker works and looking at what they do. And the new thing now, and it hasn't been around a whole lot, um, the new thing is to adapt the workspace to the person instead of the person adapting, adapting the workspace. Uh, I just had a company the other day and they had a, a great big large circuit board and the guy was putting wires in and, and uh, soldering those in place and they had elevated the workstation and had it sitting right up in front of him so he was working like this. In the old days that had been here on the table and he'd have been like this for eight hours a day with the soldering like that. So you can see the problems that you have posture, discs, muscle skeleton. So um, with, with ergonomics we do a lot of education and we do a lot of proper body mechanics with people. Uh, most people don't know how to lift properly. Some people think they just come in and you pick something up. We go over the hole, you got to squat down, get a wide base, pick something up, keep it close, and you're not going to twist with it. You're going to move your feet. It's going to take about the same amount of time, but hopefully we're going to prevent a back injury by doing that. Uh, most people haven't even thought of that. We had one guy in our clinic the other day, uh, he had a disc herniation on L4, and he was bending over picking up a pencil. So it wasn't the weight, it was just that he had been bending wrong for 30, 40 years. He never even thought about taking a pencil. Now, the right way is the golfers pick up, like pick up the golf ball, come around his neck, the back stays pretty straight. This guy was just doing this all day, and he's been doing it for years. So it wasn't the weight, it was just the, the improper body you can't see. You know, and he really didn't know me better. So this is, this is, whenever you type in ergonomics, all these pictures come up, it's usually a workspace like this with, with keyboard and everything, that's usually what people think of ergonomics, but it could be anything. It could be operating the drill press, it could be welding, it could be doing anything like that where you're just trying to make it easier on the person. So what we try to do is limit the awkward body positions, um, limit bending and twisting, have the product move to a marker, and we try to reduce the loads. Some of it could be as simple as uh, the product comes in, let's say it's bags of quick creep, and they're making the uh, sidewalk, don't pick up two bags of quick creep, pick up one bag of quick creep, take two trips, uh, have someone help you. It's just going to, it's going to take a little bit longer, but if you have an injury, it's really going to slow the company down, and it's going to cost the company. So the company would rather you take two trips, uh, 30 yards carrying quick creep, versus one trip carrying quick creep and injuring your back. So uh, the awkward body positions, and a lot of times I don't have all the answers, I go into a business and I'll, I'll uh, look at someone who's working. I say, man, they have, you know, this is an awkward position. One company had an automatic welder. They were welding a bulkhead on something. And so the welder would look in like this and twist up. And then he'd have a button he did and he got the right weld. 
So I was like, something is, something is going on. I see I was having neck pain because he was doing this all day. Is there something he could figure out? And the engineers came in and they had this uh, little series of mirrors. So the guy could stand like this and look in the mirror and he could see right where he's going. So he didn't have to do this position anymore. So something as simple as probably cost maybe $50 to put some mirrors on there could have saved, you know, $100,000 neck pain. So that's what we're looking for with adaptive workspace. You want to adapt it to the person. Uh, make everything easy right in front of you if it's easy to get to. For those that are at computer desks, you want to sit in a nice neutral posture. Shoulders 90, elbows 90, arms straight across. A keyboard that moves up and down is great so you can adjust it to where you need it when you're typing. When you're typing like this all day, that's when you get the proper funnel stuff after 20, 30 years. Uh, we had a woman at the hospital, she called said, can you guys come help me in my workspace? I showed up, she had a little crappy chair, she had a pillow stuck behind her back, she had a blanket that she rolled up that she was using as a wrist guard, she had her keyboard propped up with the little legs in the back were propped up, her screen was way back, so she was doing like this. So I moved the screen up, put her keyboard down, adjusted her chair up, adjusted the seat back up to where she was, and got her in a neutral position, and a week later she called back and said, I feel great. Everything feels better. I was getting ready to call the doctor to see what I could do. Um, so just a couple little key points like that saved her from having to go to the doctor. And who knows what happened when she got to the doctor? What they were suggesting. So reducing the forces and the loads. Sometimes as simple as getting a cart or picking something up and carrying it. Uh, one company we went to, the mechanic would come in in the morning. He'd get all his tools. He'd put in his big toolbox and he carries it wherever he's going to work. I said, hey, why don't you get a cart and carry that, push it on a cart. Well, I didn't know I could ask for a cart. I'm not sure you can. There's a cart right over here. That's fine. Unless you got to put that on there. It just made that easier for him to do. Uh, so how do we identify the major forces and stresses? Well, this is actually what we use. We have this force gauge. It's called a Mark 10. Ours has handles on it. And down here, you just screw a hook on. I take a piece of rope. I'll throw it around. Uh, let's say it's a pallet jack. I'll throw it around a pallet jack hook it in there, hit the button, and when I pull, the reading will come up here on the force gauge and how many pounds it is that it will pull. So I have an idea of what he's doing, pulling and pushing wise. I take a scale, if they're lifting, if they're loading boxes, I weigh the boxes. How much does this box weigh? Okay, I know this guy's lifting 50 pounds, and I take, a, I take measure and I measure, he's lifting 50 pounds from this 8 inch shelf up to a 32 inch cart. He's doing this repetitively. Okay, so we know he's lifted 50 pounds. Could we make it easier? Could we have that product from 8 inches? Could we get it up on another shelf that's 32 inches? So he just has to slide it over onto the cart. Simple little things like that. Uh, but with this, we get a very detailed job description. Let me show you. Let me like. get out of this for a second. So with that, what I do is I follow someone around for about three or four hours during the day. I said, tell me everything that you do, and I weigh everything that they do, I take this first stage and measure everything. So this guy, his name is Nick, he stocks all the groceries at the, at the uh, hospital. He was our first client, we just did this uh, uh, as we're going through training. And so this is the form that we develop. So we know that Nick, the first thing he does, he receives goods in on pallets and he transports to the storage center. So they, they come in on the dock, he puts them all on a pallet, takes a pallet jack and he takes it to the cooler. So you know he needs 30 pounds of force to grip the handle on the pallet jack. He needs 50 pounds to push and pull the load of the pallet. And he's going up to 1,000 feet. And he needs 12 pounds just to pump it up and down. The next thing that he does is unload goods from pallets to the rolling cart. So he gets the pallet close to the, close to the freezer, brings the cart out, puts it on the cart, and he rolls it in the freezer. Uh, so he's lifted 50 pounds to pick up the heavy item. Uh, I think that was a box of pans or something that they were cooking that day. Uh, so we have this detailed job description. You can see exactly what he does throughout the day. There's a lot of benefits to, to getting this. Let me scroll down and show you. Um, throughout the day, at the end, he rotates over our stock, then they clean up. Um, from that, we further break it down <coughs> what he's doing specifically during the day. And he's thing lifts are 75 pounds. That's an empty pallet. He's stacking it up on other pallets. Um, so now, if Nick was ever injured on the job, we know exactly what he needs to do to get back to work. We know what he needs to be able to lift, what he needs to be able to push and pull. We can mimic that in the clinic so that we can actually have him doing his job before he goes out to work. The other thing that we can do, we can send Nick back to work. He just can't lift 75 pounds. 
He is getting much better. He can lift 30, 40 pounds. We're going to put him back to work in light duty. We're just going to have someone else help him go out and load the pallets. So we got Nick back to work a lot sooner and a lot quicker, which is saving the company time and money. And from this, what we also develop is, we call it ergonomic opportunities. We can't call them ergonomic suggestions. If I say, do you have an ergonomic suggestion for you, the company doesn't do it, someone gets injured, they can get sued and we can get sued because they come back and say, well, you made the suggestion and they didn't do it. So we call them opportunities. It's just uh, the little means that you have to do these days is, is I've got to learn. So we've looked at everything, we see the goods, moving loaded pallets. Nick was not trained on how to use an electric pallet jack. They had one sitting there, but he did not go through the class to do it. The electric pallet jack would have been much easier for him. So I said, hey, why doesn't Nick go through the class and take the electric pallet jack class? Well, OK, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and door stops, because he would get to a door, and in the hospital, they got the fire doors that were always closed. So he would hold the door like this, and he's pulling his pallet, trying to hold the door open. I said, hey, grab a door stop, put in your pocket, put the door stop under there, pull through. So just a couple little things like that. This probably cost the, the hospital you know, $2 for us to be able to do that. It could have prevented an injury. Um, now, when we see something big, like uh, you know, a line that may need to be elevated or something, we usually make that a suggestion as like a capital improvement, because ever, eventually they're going to upgrade, upgrade all their equipment, so they're going to look at something like that. Um, so from that, we, get, we got all these ideas as far as what we could do. Um, the pallets, 75 pounds used to employees. There's usually someone around there that you can help, and it's just a short portion of the day that you can grab someone to help you. Um, Nick would be in the kitchen, and you have to go check and see if all his groceries showed up. So he'd walk a thousand feet down, truck's not here, walk all the way back, and do that five or six times. It's very unproductive. He wasn't able to really do anything in the kitchen. He wasn't able to do all of his uh, inventory he was supposed to do, because he had to walk down and check it. But there's a person who's down there, so why don't they pick up the phone and call you? So that was our other suggestion. So it was really kind of some simple stuff that we did. So these are the tools that we use. Uh, this is a hand grip dynamometer. So someone who's using a, a screwdriver or a wrench, what we'll have them do is say, okay, tighten that screw. Reach over, grab the hand dynamometer, and we'll get a grip strength. And again, we try to do it three times to see if you get an accurate description. Some of them like to exaggerate. Oh, I gripped that hard. I'm like, no, you didn't grip that hard. Let me try. I'll try tightening the screw, and then I'll grab the grip gauge. Uh, some of them like to uh, kind of exaggerate about how tough the belt is. Um, so we use the, the hand dynamometer to measure that pitch. We have a pitch gauge. Um, we have people that the that plastic bags and they stay together. The person would pinch them real hard, take them off, and then put them on a different hook. So that was their jobs. They had a huge pitch. So for that person, if we're going to do rehab, we're going to be doing a lot of rehab and hand stuff. We're going to be working on a lot of pitch stuff. So, so we take our pitch gauge and we get a measure of that well. So we get the job description and it shows you. Now from that, we can do a lot of different things. Um, that job description that I had, if we want to test people before they come in, we can see if they can actually do the job. So if I'm going to hire someone to take Nick's job, I want someone who's going to be able to look at a 75-pound pallet and be able to place it up on the stack. So they would come in, and uh, that is called a post-offer pre clone screening. And they say, OK, we're going to hire you based that you pass your drug test, based that you pass uh, your physical with the doctor, you don't have to have a blood pressure, and based that you pass your post-offer pre clone screening. So they come into us. And we'll actually have a box that weighs about 75 pounds. So they'll have to squat down and pick it up and set it on a certain amount. And they have to do it two or three times and then check them off that they were able to do it. Next thing they have to do is uh, 50 pounds to pick up whatever product it was from 8 inches. we we'll have another shelf there at 32 inches. So they'll be able to put that up. They have a sled. They'll have to push a sled and then be over 1,000 feet to so see they can push and pull the pallet down and back. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've, we've developed that so we can hire someone. So the biggest problem that companies have is they hire someone, they get in, they work for about three weeks, and this job's awful, I didn't know it was going to be this hard, I didn't know I had to do all this, I'm out. Or they get in, they're in there three or four weeks, they have an injury, um, they weren't, weren't trained with the proper body mechanics, um, and this is all costing the company time and money. So 
Uh, we don't tell the company, yes, hire this person, we don't hire this person. We tell them they were able to pass these tests that failed on the 75 power pallet jack. You can still hire them if you want to, but just can't make the 75 power pallets. Maybe you want to put them in a different position so it's, something, it's up to the company, and which kind of reduces the possible litigation for us. Uh, we can also determine you know, the right to work guidelines for the return to work and what will be full duty and light duty. So, Someone, so Mick was injured, he can come in, he just came to take like over 50 pounds, he has a lifting restriction from his doctor. Okay, well here's what you can do. You can do tasks two, three, five, and six. And you just can't do those two tasks that are the heaviest. So you can come back to work, we can get you back to work. Because the longer they stay on workers' comp, the longer they're injured, the harder it is to get back to work. Uh, this is a pre, uh, pre employment post office screen, which is whatever. The other thing is the physician is stepped in the loop and the physical therapist. So this job description goes with them when they go to the doctor. So the doctor knows exactly what their job is. A lot of times in the PT clinic we'll hear, but what do you do? Well, I, I'm a carpenter. Okay, well, what do you do? Well, I play stuff. Well, what do you do? I mean, what do we need to do to get you back? I understand we're going to do some range of motion and some strengthening, but how much strengthening do we need to do? How much grip do you need to hold a nail down so that you can put nails in, in the boards? Um, so those specific things. Sometimes you also have the employee, because they don't want to go back to work, will tell the doctor, uh, I can't go back to work. That's just, it's just too hard. I, there's no way I can do it. I have to lift 500 pounds. And the doctor says, well, let me see your job description. And there's one that we haven't done. It might just say, uh, employee has to lift uh, shingles from this height to this height. It might even say that. Say, employee may have to lift shingles to take to the roof, or employee does roofing. Maybe something as simple as that. With this, the doctor knows well, a bundle of shingles is 56 pounds. Okay, I think he can lift 56 pounds. He's well, he can't get back to work. So, won't give me this, it's too hard, you can't do it. So, no, so get the person back to work. So, workers' comp. Workers' comp is if there's an injury on the job and, and you're required to be off, you get workers' comp. Workers' comp is paid into by the employer and it is. Uh, mandated by the federal government that you have to do that. The money goes in um, to certain accounts. It's very complicated how it all works. But that money is there, so if someone is injured, we can pay that employee 66.6% .6 of the salary tax-free. So if you have someone out here who's working at a car deal, they have a pretty strenuous job, they get injured, they're off work four weeks, they're sitting at home, hey, this is pretty nice. I'm making 66.6% .6 of the salary, Surveys online during the day to pick up another 50 bucks a day. I don't have to pay for childcare because I'm watching the kids. I'm making it. I'm going to try to milk this cow as long as I can. I'm going to try to stay on workers' comp. Uh, and it could be a vicious cycle that they get into. Some of them really want to come back to work. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to rehab them to get them back. Um, so you got to really be careful because it's, some view it as kind of a vacation. Some, some physical therapists don't want to work with workers' comp patients because they kind of have the stigma of whether they're just trying to stay off the workers' comp they can. Some of them actually are like that. Some of them really want to get back to work, they just can't. Um, so they get on workers' comp, we get them rehabbed, they go back, they, they weren't rehabbed completely to the job that they needed to do, they're back injured again two months later, or back in the whole workers' comp cycle. As I said before, the worst thing you see is, uh, you know, they get on pain pills, they get an addiction, they lose their quality of life, their wife divorced them, lose their kids. Uh, it's really debilitating. Uh, they, they lose their sense of self-worth, uh, you know, because they were a voter. That's what they did. Everyone knew them as a voter. Now they can be well. Uh, you know, it's really devastating, mentally, physically, emotionally to the person. So our goal is to come in and try to prevent this from ever happening. And you can see how it saves the company money. And it also saves the people from getting addicted to pain pills, having an injury have a surgery, maybe losing more of their wife and kids. So it's a win-win for everybody. Now our fee for us to go out and do that, $150 an hour on the um, And that's usually myself and or physical therapist that come out. Um, there's six of us on the team from Augusta Health. We have two OTs, two PTs, and two athletic trainers. And we go out and we all work independently or work well with each other. Um, we'll send a team of two out usually job descriptions and ergonomic opportunities. Some companies just want us to come in and teach back safety, which we'll do. Um, the, the other things that we do. We do 
do, a company's contract is out to do, the postal offer pre employment screenings. They may have a good job description, they just want to do the screenings, and they'll send them in with us. Um, and all that runs usually about 150 an hour. That number is picked out because that's about what a PT makes in the clinic for an hour. So if you get a PT for an hour, your insurance is paying $150 an hour. Now, the PTs don't get paid $150 an hour. I don't get paid $150 an hour. I wish I did. But I mean, so. Functional capacity exams. If you have someone that's trying to get permanent disability, sometimes the employer will request what's called a functional capacity exam. This exam will test everything that they do: um, bending, lifting, pushing, pulling. They even have hand, front hand motor stuff. It takes about four hours for a functional capacity exam. At that, then they, they, have, they take those measurements and they determine what their level of disability is. Um, functional capacity exams can't build off of your job function description. That as part of your functional capacity, if you have a good functional job description. If not, it's kind of a generic one that's out there. I think it's lifting 40 pounds from one arm to another, pushing 50 pounds. Then they have this big board set up, and you got to take a, a peg and put in it, and they put a washer on it, and then a sleeve over it. It's called a peg washer sleeve. You do that repetitively to see if they have fine pain or skills that they can do like the work. Um, and people don't like it when they go through this, and they're going to try to lag because they have some of them permanent disability. So they're going to try to lag, and uh, I can't pick that up. But I think you probably could. Yeah, there's no way I can do it. So it's kind of this tussle that you have. Um, this is not very popular among PTs to do this. One of the physical therapists that I guess that has higher selection. You have to do one of these because he told the guy, yeah, you can. And you can go back to work. And so well, and then I can. And kind of feel good about it. So, um, but that is one thing that we can do to build off of the, the general function description. So in conclusion, the industrial setting is growing. Um, there's a lot of different uh, certifications out there. There's a lot of companies that are starting to do this. This is really in its infancy. You're going to start seeing a lot of this. Um, there's a lot of companies that are, that are starting to do it. Uh, I looked on the National Athletic Trainers website and was just looking down the jobs and I was looking like 20% now are really industrial medicine for, for athletic trainers. It was before or 10 years ago and they've been one or two in the whole site, you can see that. So it's really starting to grow. We're starting to tap into athletic trainers, physical therapists, occupational therapists that come out and do this. And companies are starting to see the benefits. Around here is still kind of the old boys, uh, good old boys. We need to spend more money on trucks and running equipment versus health and safety. The guys coming in and take the dip out and they don't want to do stretches or exercise before they work. Um, but, you know, that is what's best for them. If you look over in Japan, they come in, they do calisthenics first thing in the morning. Don't get stretched up. Now if I'm going to go play a football game, I'm going to go out and I'm going to stretch up. These guys we use the term industrial athlete because they are using their body to make a living. So anyone who uses their body to make a living we consider them an athlete. So if you're going to go out and perform something that's kind of strenuous, you're going to want to be more stretch up before you do that. Um, so that's our kind of our motto as far as let's come in, let's get them to do just a few stretches and exercises. Someone who's doing all the repetitive hand stuff, we're going to stop we're going to do Stretches. We have two ladies uh, that work at this company that, that would fill in the pavement. Um, they make very large air conditioners and they would climb inside and they did wiring all day. And she was 58 years old and she climbed out. She said, By the end of the day, I can't open my hand. I have to take my other hand and throw it right open. I've been using the clippers all day, cutting the wires. So, well, okay, so we looked at her job. I'm like, How long are you in here? Well, for the, these many hours, we'll take a break in this many hours. I was like, well, here's another electrician who does the same thing you do on the outside. You guys switch every hour. You guys can switch every hour and try using your other hand to clip when you can. And then I want you to stop every hour. I want you to do this stretch for 20 seconds. I want you to do this stretch for 20 seconds. When you stop your lunch break, we're going to fill in one of these and one of these. And make those little suggestions. Just a couple little mini pause stretches to make a huge difference for me. Um, She's still uh, using her hands a lot, but in her pocket at the end of the day before she went home. So, just a couple little things like that that we can do. Uh, now, I wish that I could go in. Everyone that was up at the site that had any type of injury, they could come over to me. Hey, I stepped in the hole yesterday. My ankle's kind of sore. I wish I could do a full evaluation. Like, oh, yeah, you have a grade 2 ATF screen. 
We're going to get you on some ankle pumps. We're going to get you doing some uh, calf raises. We're going to get it all strengthened up and get you back out there. However, that breaks into workers' compensation. Once I start doing that, I've injected myself into the workers' comp cycle. They have to go through a doctor if it's a workplace injury. It has to be documented. And all this is for litigation. But stuff that I can do and is spelled out all over OSHA. I can do ice. I can do heat. You can do massage. I can recommend that they take Advil, as recommended on the bottle. Um, I can tell them, hey, you know the stretches that we do every morning? Maybe number three and number four would be really good ones for you to really focus on here lately. Um, so I'm not setting up a rehab for them. Because once I do that, it can make it emotionally portable, uh, make them uh, it interferes with the position, and if you get the position, you have to contact the position within 24 hours of their injury. Um, they only have certain positions they can see, they're supposed to be specialized in workers' compensation. So we cannot just inject ourselves into that. I wish it was that easy that we could do what we do here on the fields, um, but we just can't. That's just the way the laws work. Does anybody have any questions on on that right now? Yeah. Yes. When did this industry start or this field start? Uh, really the 1970s when OSHA came about. Um, we started seeing it more in foreign companies. Um, but here recently, within the last 20 years, I would say we really started to see this. Uh, I'll show and show you just a number of companies. Uh, these are just Tip of the iceberg companies, these are companies that actually is where they specialize in this is what they do. Um, they go around and do on site at that training. Um, BSI is a company that we bought the rights to to use their form to do the functional job descriptions. But most of them do something similar to that, they just want to call it functional job descriptions um, because that's copyrighted. So just these companies here do that, uh, provide those services, and there's tons more. I mean, Augusta Health just now started doing it, so we're starting to see it some of the smaller ones. So, anyone else have any questions? Can you tell them what you have to do to get your OSHA, OSHA certification, time commitment? Okay. Um, with Augusta Health, there's a three day training uh, course that I took with them through a company called DSI, which is up there. Uh, DSI is the predecessor to Fort Well. And I got a DSI certification, and it was three days ago, and actually on site with someone who works with DSI and showing us how to use the force gauge and how to write up everything. Uh, I have my OSHA 10 certification. OSHA 10 is just 10 hours of training on OSHA certifications and OSHA regulations. Um, that's online. You can do that online. There's pretty much anything you can take online, which is the way it is with anything anymore. There's anything from certified ergonomic specialists to people who specialize in the petroleum field, to um, forklift operator instructors, um, because a lot of companies need forklift operation instruction, um, some are audio. Uh, if you really just search it online, uh, University of South Florida has a good program where you can go on their website and find a bunch of this stuff. Um, if you have a company who, uh, with Augusta Health, we have nutritionists, we have uh, you know, dietitians, we have people that specialize in smoking cessation, um, so we can pull from those resources. Some people out here have companies that specialize just in teaching OSHA 10 and forklift operation and forklift safety. Some specialize just in scaffolding safety. Um, so you can specialize in that. So it's really a, a broad field that you can take to go into. What was the cost? Uh, $60 for me to take OSHA 10. It took, it took 10 hours. Um, and then from that, there's OSHA 30, which is 30 hours. And it's, it's so. So they're out there, it's anywhere from 60 up to a thousand or two thousand dollars for a class just depending on what you want, what you want to get. All this makes you more marketable. Um, one thing I would do if I had to do it all over again is industrial hygiene. Um, you can be a certified industrial hygienist. And they're the ones that do all the, the quality of air monitoring, they do the noise monitoring, um, they have the monitors and they've been trained how to do that and they do really well. You know, I, I remember doing, when I worked in the clinic, um, we would do some of these, but, but it's becoming bigger. Could somebody actually start their own business oh, and yeah. actually do pretty well? Yeah, you, you definitely could. You could start your own business. Um, you could contract out for other businesses. This company right here, Inside Health, uh, my good friend I went to school with, she works for Inside Health, and they are uh, nationwide. Um, so I was talking to her. I said, hey, around what's going on? I said, I'm doing something somewhere down here. 
and I was telling her about the post offer recruiting from the screening. She's like, we would love to get into that with my company. Uh, is there any way we can pay you a consulting fee to help us set those up? Yeah, sure. I can do that. $50 an hour. Yeah, no, that's no problem. Um, so I helped develop a test for Budweiser, the beer delivery truck guys. Um, and so they're going to come in, they have a half keg and a full keg, they start with a half keg, can they pick it up, put it on the dolly, can they take it up a flight of stairs and back down? And they go to the full keg and check those off. Um, I said I developed the test for them, and the Budweiser that approved the test, and they just getting ready to, to try to improve them. So, and, and I started, I do have my little company on the side that I started because, because of that. Contracting service for nationwide, so it's it's there. And you want to do it? Do it. So. We got time to do the EMS stuff, or yeah, yes, yeah. nice. Uh, Front up. Yeah. Okay. Is anyone here interested in uh, emergency medicine, pre-hospital care? Anybody a little bit? Okay. Uh, nursing. Anyone want to be a nurse? You can go to UVA right now. They pay you five thousand dollars starting on bonus. Five thousand dollars to move close to UVA. Right out the door. You can go anywhere you want. My dad's friend was a biologist for the state of West Virginia. He retired, got his nursing degree, moved to Hawaii, works 20 hours, and he serves in the morning and will work uh, 20 hours a week as a nurse and makes enough to live off his retirement and his nursing. So you can go anywhere you want in the world for your nurse. So we'll go over EMS, uh, talk about EMS, how it's growing, what we're doing out in the field, some of the new stuff that we're doing. Um, there's a lot of research that's being pumped into pre hospital care because we're, we're seeing that you know, that's where we can actually save lives. You know, if we get there quick, what drugs do we need to get right away? What procedures do we need to start doing right away? What can we do to help? Um, there's a larger demand for EMS. Uh, Bridgewater Rescue Squad probably runs about 4,000 calls a year. Uh, when they opened up in the 70s, they were probably at 200 or 300 calls a year. Um, that's just because we have an aging population, people living longer. So we just have more people that are calling for ambulances. People call for ambulance for everything. They call 911 because they were having to go to the bathroom for 24 hours, all kinds of stuff. Uh, toe pain, headaches, we hear it all. Um, I work as a firefighter and I'm also a medic. I'm an EMTR through the state. Um, so I'm a medic. I can start IVs. I can uh, put needles in people's chest to, to relieve the pressure, for some attention to the thorax. I can give all types of drugs, I can shock people while they're awake, if I can read the rhythm correctly. Um, so there's a lot of things that I can do in the field. Um, so we are on the, I'm on the more serious calls, uh, anything that says that chest pain is difficult breathing I'm on, shooting, stabbings, anything that would that car accidents that put the fire department on for additional medical resources. Um, there are a number of uh, new drugs that are out, those are also making hard for us and they throw off of the duster stuff to meth to bath salts to spice, which seems to be getting more popular now. And those are causing some people to have issues and go on to something as well. Uh, so EMS usually follows the military patterns. Um, usually everything that we do came from what happened in the military in the field. Uh, tourniquets, triage, all those started in the military. Uh, drugs that we're giving, plasma, getting plasma within the field, which we're starting to do in Richmond in the military. Um, so we kind of follow what they do. Um, how it works is first responders are EMTs. Uh, they can be an EMT paramedic or they could be just a regular EMT, um, which can't do all the drugs or start IVs. They're probably the ones that are going to show up first. We get the person, we're going to send them to the hospital. Uh, it's either Augusta Health, RMH, closest one that we can. Um, they're going to help try to get them stabilized and then they're going to a trauma center and GPTA. Um, yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, okay. Uh, let me show you real quick. We get through the new trend. It's called community paramedicine. And um, what is going on is the Affordable Care Act is saying that if you have an injury, let's say you have a, a COPD and you're in the hospital, they discharge you. You cannot go back to the hospital for 60 days. And if they're, or otherwise, uh, Medicare, Medicaid is not going to pay the hospital anything. So the hospital, instead of eating all those costs, are paying EMTs and Stuff like that. And people like me go out and check in on these people and adjust the medicine if we can, talk to the doctor, do the eyes and ears from them, try to keep them back in the hospital for 60 days. So, anybody have any questions with that? Then, a couple quick little things. We reduce hypothermia. We have uh, 
a code, someone who's, who's died, and we bring them back and get the calls back, um, we're reducing the third again. We're also doing what's called a CCR or a CPR, but we're not reading for the person for the first five minutes of the code. That's just the flow of the code. Um, and then here's all the new technology. This device here, we'll actually do chest impressions for you. You hit a button, and that's chest impressions for you. So you show up, you hook this on, you hook this on, this tells you when to shock, and you go grab a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.